go. And of course, we'll, he's um, we're willing to read off your questions off of Slack as well. So feel free to chime in there. The first question comes from Lee. Please uh, um, let me um, go ahead and, um, yep. Can you introduce yourself and ask your question? Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, this is Lee from uh, UT Austin. So. Uh, I have two quick questions. Um, one is similar to the last paper. So if you would have to have multiple, um, let's say if I want to implement um, scheduling strategy from different kind of application would potentially share the resource um, across the stack in a very fine grain fashion. You know, um, what kind of isolation guarantee or do you, in, do you envision that uh, Syrup would provide any sort of uh, performance isolation for these kind of application at all? So that's the first question. The second question is, for user level uh, scheduling policies, what kind of information do you, do you think the user would have this visibility to? I kind of like the idea that you have, you know, KV store uh, to store all the scheduling uh, status um, inside of um, the, the framework. But, you know, if, if a scheduling policy would like to um, access a very low level information, for, for example, the content in the queue, you know, is, is that possible to, to do that? Um, that's just the two question. thank you. Okay, can you hear me? I'm sorry, because yep. the first time I'm speaking. Okay. Okay, thank you for the questions. They're both very good. So for the first one, for this paper, we basically we partition the resources between the applications in a static way. And uh, then we use like the syrup to like in order to schedule the resource within one application. But like in the future, we envision using like like maybe like administrator defined syrup policies to partition the resource between applications as well. Uh, yeah, so for now. With statically partition, so there's no like no risk, uh, you know, for contention or like on course, for example. And the second question, that's very good actually. Uh, so the fact that we're able to run the scheduling code like like in the kernel is very helpful, because for example, the BPF code that's running in the kernel and it's defined by the user it can like access the queue length, and then maybe uh, like it can or information about the queue length, like in a map that's accessible by user space. And that's how we pass information, you know, like about the low levels of the stack, like around between layers. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, let's, uh, since Yang was first to come, she's a live uh, question asker. Let's have her go next. And then we'll get to the well, slide um, So it's great work. Uh, I have a question regarding the scheduler in the NIC. Um, so in Shinjuku, you have the centralized dispatcher to enforce um, single queue or multiple queue policy. So does uh, the scheduler in the NIC in Syrup uh, carry out a similar um, policy? So like, like, unfortunately, the thing about the networking stack in Linux is that it only supports like early binding. Uh, so it's hard to queue things in the network stack and schedule to an executor when like one becomes available. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, as soon as a packet arrives at the NIC, we, we need to uh, to decide which of their excuse to send it to. So we cannot, mm -hmm. you know, wait until one, like, let's say that all are like are all occupied. We cannot wait for one to like to become available and then schedule. We need to decide like at the moment, like a packet arrives, mm -hmm. and that's, and we think that you know that's like something that's missing from the existing neighboring stack in Linux, and we hope it's gonna change in the future so that we can support uh, like Shinjuku-like scheduling, uh, mm -hmm. like like in the NIC or the network stack. Uh, so I might have a second question regarding yeah. the core allocation. Um, so can application occupy multiple cores? And um, yeah. those multiple cores can share one scheduler or they can, uh, specify individual scheduler on different cores. So, uh, so for now we have like like a scheduler for each application, mm -hmm. which is like each scheduler is a ghost a user space agent mm -hmm. that schedules like in the enclave, like that's you know Jack like mm -hmm. explained before that belongs to the application. Oh, uh, okay. So can you dynamically allocate cores to application during the execution? Yeah, we can, but we don't do it yet, but it's like it's feasible. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. thank you. All right, let's uh, jump to some of the Slack questions. Yep, so um, Marios uh, wanted to know um, if uh, how expressive Syrup can be, are there specific classes of policies that cannot be expressed in Syrup and others where it shines? 
uh, how could you uh, express fairness, for example, as online matching? So like as explained to Young, the policies that are not easy to express in the networking stack part of Syrup are the ones that you know, require the, you know, the late binding in the networking stack. But for fairness, for example, we have like a policy on the paper where we like assign like a number of tokens to request like types, and then we schedule based like on the available you know tokens that are replenished in user space. Yeah, so we can do something like that for sure. The like the only limitation might be the BPF limitation, like you know like all the checks that need to happen by like by BPF. But like as we saw, that was not a big issue. Practice because scheduling, like the policies, the code for the policy is quite simple, like in most cases. All right. Um, we have another question from uh, Ali Reza from QMUL. Um, do you think the eBPF engine prevents the scheduler to run as fast as possible, more complex policies, or scheduling algorithms spend more CPU cycles for every decision? No, I don't think so because, like the DBPF policy, like the code that we deploy in DBPF is compiled to like to native code, so it shouldn't affect the the like the overall like overhead and latency of the system. And we have like the figures, the paper. It's like the decision itself is a few cycles. It's more like the cost is like actually like enforcing it, and for example, you're not redirecting a packet to a different socket than yeah the one it was like like initially going to, but the policy itself like is very low overhead and simple. Right. I think there's a, there's a few more questions on Slack and there's, um, there's a good question that kind of keeps coming up between, has come up between the last two that we will try to um, get to at the end. So um, even if we have to run a little bit into a break, it'd be easy discussion. Yeah. So maybe I can just point you to it now so that you can start thinking about it in advance. Some, some folks are kind of asking like the relationship between this, for example, and scheduler activations um, and other things like user level thread scheduling. And in fact, I think even one of the questions I have here is that it seems like um, things like Ghost might put more pressure on certain applications because it, it seems like, you know, the kernel can only schedule things that it's aware of. So this Kind of pushes you into the space of kernel threads, um, mainly for scheduling units. But but um, maybe take a look at Andrew Quinn's um, um, message yep. in Slack there and be thinking about that. And we can come back to that at the end. So thanks, Kostis. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, let's go on to the last talk. So the um, the final talk in the session is by Max Demelin, who will make the case for non uh, work conserving scheduling and uh, work. Thank you, Kostis, for that great presentation. It's pretty interesting how it ties in with the previous one as well. Uh, do we have any live questions? Please raise your hands. We have Max, I think. Max, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. OK. That is, um, yeah, I guess um, I, I have a question for you. Do you see any sort of scheduling policies that could be limited by um, the BPF VM's limitations, like you know, no floating points and uh, no, no loops? So like now you can do loops in BPF, but oh, really? they need to be bounded. Yeah, they need to be bounded. Okay. So you need to know like the exact, like the maximum number of iterations that you can do. But yeah. for floating point, I don't think that's big of an issue because most schedulers, I mean, maybe if you want to use like some like very basic learning policy, maybe you want something like learning, but I'm not sure. But the main limitation I think is that the kernel networking stack does not support, you know, late binding. So it's hard to queue, you know, packets in the stack and assign them to a socket when a socket becomes available. You need to choose a socket as soon as a packet arrives, for example. And that's the main limitation of like an BPF based approach, which can change. Like it's not an BPF thing, it's a kernel thing. And if we like, and if we make that an option in the kernel, we can like also deploy, you know, late binding policies. I see, that makes sense. So even the XDP probes cannot let you uh, do late binding? Like, I mean, I, like, I haven't, like, I, like I haven't figured out the way myself yet. So maybe we we can talk after if you have ideas on how to do that. 
I'm, I'm just curious. Well, thank you very much. Jogyu, you want to ask your question? Uh, thank you for the great talk. I have a couple of questions. First, I, I'm actually, I left the questions in the Slack too for the clarity. Yep. First, uh, what's the goal of scheduling? So it is, I mean, maybe I missed some points, but kind of curious if it also provide prioritization of certain threat or only for just full fairness, or also does it also provide APIs to users to control some certain properties <clears throat> such as C groups? Short or yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the short answer for that is no. It's so syrup is like initially intending for scheduling within an application. So you get like a static, like a partition of the resources, let's say like a number, like number of cores for an application, like, and then you choose how to schedule things on this number of cores, like on the number of cores that you get. So it's mostly within an application, but there's nothing fundamental that locks us from scheduling, you know, like, like to use like a zero defined administrator policy to schedule like between applications. Uh, and like in that case, like I don't think that even a C group makes much sense as an abstraction. It's, it's you match the application context to, to with a core and then you can keep which is, you know, high priority and which is low, like, like in the scheduling policy, like and do that without involving like, you know, C groups or the kernel. Also like, I've heard even Microsoft started to support eBFF and eBFF will be extended to you know, even inside storage, like in, in the case of computational storage. Do you think such uses of eBFF for communication between kernel or device and applications to become a norm in the future? Like kernel I mean, line or whatever stuff? Yeah. Like, I mean, I hope they do because they give the kernel the opportunity to have like insight and application specific information. That the application developer knows. And with that, we can build like better policies with like a much lower, you know, development effort combined, you know, compared to having to deploy like a new like scheduling class, for example, in the kernel. So yeah, I hope like I think that things are moving like to that way, and I hope they continue to do so in the future. Thank you so much. By the way, I'm Jonggi Park from Songgyan University. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Any other uh, live questions? If not, I have one. Um, sure. It's kind of on the designability and the ease of writing these scheduling policies, right? So um, I, I have two questions about that. First is, how do you actually help somebody design a scheduling policy? Because, you know, I've encountered application developers who write the application, but they don't know much about how to write the scheduling policy. So can you provide some hints on how to do this. And the second follow up is that, you know, I can end up writing extremely unoptimized code. Um, you, you wrote the round robin scheduler policy, which works really great, but I could end up writing really unoptimized code there, which uh, does really badly. So how do you prevent these kinds of problems? So, so for now, we do nothing about that. It's just, uh, we give the opportunity to the developers to easily implement a policy, like as a matching function. So like we want to make it to, you know, logically easy for them to implement the policy without having, you know, to interact with the, with the low level mechanism of the system, like, you know, how to send an interrupt to a core or how to forward like a packet to like a specific socket, like, or things like that. On how to make the, like the policies that the developers deploy faster, that's a different question. It's a very interesting one, actually. And for that, like, like for now, I think that like zero, but like, as you mentioned, is mostly targeted for expert users that know the specific characteristics of the applications like in the underlying system. But in the future, maybe we have like a self-adaptive policy in the hook that, that the syrup code is running. And that way the user will need to know nothing about that. Like and the learned policy will be able to, you know, to like to reach whatever goal the like uh, the user sets. But uh, yeah, that's a very good point that you, you mentioned. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um... Okay, I have one minute for another quick uh, question, more like a status question for you and maybe even uh, Jack and Neil who presented the previous paper. Uh, can you comment a little on the state of deployment of these tools? So like a syrup is an academic tool. So maybe 
like it's not deployed at Google. So maybe Jack and Neil should uh, like talk about uh, you know Ghost and Google. Yeah. Hey Neil, are you on right now? I'm not sure if he's on. His, uh, yeah, I'm on. So why, why, don't, why don't you take that one? Um, Ghost is it's definitely intended to be a production ready framework and we are actively working with several large footprint applications within Google uh, to deploy in production. Um, and I think that's about the extent of what I can say. Um, the code is available on GitHub. And I think when people look at the code, they will see that this is not a, this is not a tool written for a paper. This is really something that was written to run in production. And then we wrote a paper based on it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I think we are out of time. So... You muted yourself, yeah. I got muted by mistake. Uh, I don't think there are any other questions, uh, but please do post uh, questions for both of these on the Slack channel. Um, people can see that even after this presentation. It's, it's really been interesting for me so far. Uh, so let's go on to the next presentation, the last presentation for uh, this session. And uh, this is by